Thank you. Um, right. I know it's, it's, ne it's never good to start a paper with an apology, um, but, but I'm going to because <coughs> I, I, I come out of a department at Leeds where I did my PhD, uh, where I have, have a tradition of slight, slightly rabid Marxism. Um, and oh, I, oh, maybe that's in the past, but it, I'm still living through the, the, the um, aftershock of that. So that's, that's just, just warning you in advance about some other, my take on some, some of the issues that we're going to be dealing with. Um, <laughs> okay, right, yeah, good point. Uh, also, um, you know, the, I, I work in an art history department, so I, the, the debates and references in this conference have been, been quite new to me. Um, absolutely fascinating, really, really enjoyed it, found some really brilliant papers, but my, my take on it is slightly different, so I'll, I'll be interested to hear how, how it does or doesn't fit. Um, okay, so, um, Lewis Clare and the Shuddering Image. Uh, is there an opposition between the documentary and the document? In what ways is the documentary turn in filmmaking and art practice in the last 15 or 20 years uh, symptomatic of a wider concern about the relationship between the factual, the social, and the cultural? More specific to the concerns of the panel is, um, is there a, a, is a distinction between the documentary and the document helpful when we consider a specific form such as the documentary animation? These are complex questions. One way of framing these problems might be to consider any distinction between the documentary and the document as the relation between form and content. Such a uh, suggestion is not unproblematic. Post-structuralist theory has taught us to be wary of such binary oppositions. But as a starting point, hopefully it has some merits. For example, um, if we uh, suggest there is such a genre of film as animated documentary, it might be because we uh, can identify a more or less coherent form of film object. An animated documentary might or might not address certain subjects. It might or might not be constructed using certain narrative conventions. Or it might or might not conform to certain rules about how to represent issues or events. But to study the genre of documentary animation as uh, a document itself would be to consider how a so-called documentary turn in cultural production or animation shows or points to something beyond a generic category, irrespective of how contested such a genre might be. Here, the form of documentary implicitly implies another form and content. When we start to think about how animation functions as a document in this way, we start to think about how a certain set of artistic cultural forms links to a set of cultural or histor historical demands. The question would be to consider how cultural forms such as artworks or films almost regardless of the ostensible content of those films, become encoded with what might appear to be external historical content. Every film is both about something and implies something else beyond itself. In Adorno's terms, whose work I'm going to be referring to later, this is what I'm warning you about, um, in Adorno's terms, this problem with form and content would indicate how artistic forms are encrusted or enmeshed in history, despite the struggles of any particular artwork to describe, show, or even escape that very history. Such a formulation of the document is, it seems to me, implicit in Adorno's claim in, a, in aesthetic theory that every artistic form contains, and here's the quote, sedimented social content, end of quote. But so what? Surely the suggestion that films and art are products of a, special, of a specific social context is just par for the cultural studies or film studies course. My point is, I hope, more subtle. What the relationship between the form and content of the document and the documentary throws into relief is how, in the past 20 years, art and film has attempted to actively re-engage political social issues. More specifically, I'm attempting to argue that there is a reason why the documentary form has come to prominence, and it's only by considering this question, by considering the documentary as itself a document of something, uh, that we can begin to understand how and why animated documentaries are significant. Um, which, uh, perhaps rather perversely, takes me to the work of the filmmaker Lewis Clark. Um, I say perversely because Clark's work is hardly recognizable as a documentary. Certainly not in the way that films like uh, Walsh with, uh, Waltz with Basir or Persepolis might be more easily understood to fit that genre. Clark's films are not direct attempts to engage reality through naturalistic forms of representation or storytelling. His films are fragmented, um, uh, often uh, surreal, stop frame, 
uh, investigations into the image culture of 1950s America. Uh, what a discussion of Clark's work will allow me to do, though, is argue how animation can be seen to be enmeshed in history and politics as a document, even if the form of a specific film doesn't fit into a straightforward definition of what a generic documentary might be. Clark has been making uh, cut-and-paste stop-frame animated films since the late 70s. Although originally based in New York, Clark's work has a visual connection to the work of West Coast animators like Harry Smith and Larry Jordan. But um, given... Class specific context, it might also have more to do with like a 70s punk DIY thing. Um, Clark has become known for unsettling work that employs dreamlike narratives. The films are constructed from the remnants of 1940s, 50s, and 60s American mass visual culture. The magazines, adverts, and flyers left over from the so called golden age of US pop culture. So, um, you know, imagine, imagine an episode of Mad Men animated. Uh, reading the secondary literature on Clark, one invariably finds the suggestion that the sequences Clark constructs invite the viewer to drift off into an uncanny world, haunted with nostalgia for the recently lost past. And given the fact that Clark builds his film from collected archive material, it's unsurprising to find his work described as the reanimation of the disappeared world of American popular culture. These films are literally built from the material residue of our recent past to create dense psychosocial narratives out of dead images, what Clark has suggestively called cultural autobiographies. And if the ostensible material that Clark uses is outdated, so are the formal techniques he uses to make his films, stop frame and cut out, processes that are equally outmoded as the content. Um, what I want to do briefly now is just look at one film, um, Altair and then try and link it to, to some of the ideas I'm, I'm going to, well, that I've, that I've started to mention. Um, I'll say it was made in 1994 on 16 mil film from images culled from six issues of Cosmopolitan magazine, uh, an issue from the late 1940s. And it subsequently became um, part of uh, a longer uh, work that Clark did uh, called Engram Sepals from 2000. Um, now, I could show you the film. It's only about 10 minutes long, but I'm, I'm just going to quickly show you some, some screenshots uh, that made amazing images. Uh, one way of reading the film, then, is to understand it as a story of a female protagonist uh, who travels through a world populated by more or less malign forces. Now, the, the female figure keeps changing. It's not, the same, it's not actually the same um, image. It's, there is a female figure on screen, but it's not, it's not necessarily the same person. The character is swayed by the mysterious power of money, um, suffers from the vicissitudes of identity, uh, is the victim of the power of desire um, for both uh, sexual and material objects, yeah. um, and falls prey to the instability of time. Right. Unable to move into the future, she regresses into the murkiness of an unresolved past. So, you know, the clock in the background moves backwards as she waltzes across the screen. Um, the film concludes with the character engulfed in an alcoholic daze, <clears throat> um, drifting off into a stupor. The woman is smothered by the hand of an unseen antagonist trampled underfoot, the victim of uncontrolled and uncontrollable and unpredictable forces. The film is riddled with references to the stars. The title of the film refers to the... Oh, sorry, I'm out of sync. Oh, yeah. That's the figure being trampled by the shoes. OK, just catching up. Right, stars. Right, here we go. Um, the film is riddled with references to the stars. The title of the film refers to the star Altair, one of the closest stars visible to the naked eye. Um, you can also think about astrology as an allusion, perhaps, to the attempt to foresee the future. But you can also think about it as a reference to um, sort of sci-fi, 50s, 60s, American, or well, not just American, but um, attempts to, to imagine the future. Anyway. Uh, it's also got color symbolism and sort of color coding. So blue figures in the film a lot, uh, maybe as a, a thing to think about as sort of like as a reference to the ineffable or the, or the transcendental. Um, it would be easy uh, to suggest that the film simply wallows in a now lost serial past. It's ostensible content showing a fascinating, melancholic, but essentially sealed off reality. Clara's done nothing to dissuade the viewer 
from thinking of the film in this way, suggesting in interviews that his work is a Benjaminian fragment fixated on the outdated arcade that is, America, that is American popular culture. But this suggestion that the film is constructed from the archaeological remnants of a now lost culture allows us to think about how Clark's work can be read as cultural autobiography and perhaps a form of animation that has a relationship to the document. Um, Walter Benjamin, of course, was fascinated with how the detritus of the 19th century shopping arcade could, retrospectively, be interpreted as documents that link to wider cultural and political shifts. The challenge for Benjamin was to show how the fragmented rubbish of consumer capitalism was linked to the development of the dreams and nightmares of modernity. Benjamin made recourse to the form of allegory in an attempt to show how the remnants of consumption, the discarded, ad discarded adverts and objects, could not be interpreted in their immediacy simply as adverts and uh, consumables that they always had to be referred back to some further set of codes and forces. The same is true of how we understand Altair. The film can be understood to show the reality of post-war American consumer culture not as a mimetic, purely reflective documentary of the period, but as the creative reassembly of a set of codes which allude to the wider framework of post-war American society. So taking class film simply as evidence of a now dead image culture is only half the picture. Alter doesn't just represent the afterlife of American pop culture, it does something else with that discarded imagery. As Clark has commented, here's the quote, what's interesting to me about appropriation is that you are dealing with something that is received, but you are also shaping it in a way that might bring out latent meanings that are not immediately clear, end quote. So what, if I can put it like this, does Clark's shaping or collaging with animation actually do? What sort of thing is the resulting film? The challenge is to construct a way of linking the thing the film is to the wider notion of the document that I originally started with. What I want to do is now sort of explore that by referring to, to two chunks of theory. Um, and uh, the first one is going to be um, the work of uh, Siegfried Krakauer and then uh, a chunk on Adorno. So, you know, when you get to Adorno, you're almost there at the end. So it's like a flag. Of You've got there almost. OK, so my framework of references in this paper come obviously enough from critical theory in the Frankfurt School. Um, the writers and thinkers associated with critical theory were preoccupied by film and, of course, the animated, animated film. Uh, you, know, we, you know all the stuff about Fantasia and um, um, Donald Duck as being a, a, a sadomasochistic emblem of the exploited worker. And uh, Krakauer wrote about Dumbo, you know, that Dumbo was actually a, a frustrated utopian tale of emancipation. Yeah. Um, the point of interest in animation for many of these writers was the way the animated film processed and represented reality beyond the naturalizing technology of photography and cinema. The animated image was purposefully and obviously constructed. This mediation, while ostensibly disqualifying it from presenting any neutral, pure access to the world, which would obviously be suspect, actually foregrounded what it meant to imaginatively engage with, interact with, construct, and alter reality. As Gertrude Koch has noted in her book on Krakauer, film, and particularly the animated film, through the, here's a quote, mediated character of its images, insulated film against the suggestion of directness, end quote. Such a suggestion leads to the possibility that the animated film, and here's a quote, teaches us to see the world, end quote, because it allows us to see, and here's another quote, see through the false and superficial sensuousness and conventionality of things and perceive behind them the material being of things, end quote. Interestingly, Krakauer's writings on film, especially in his book, The Theory of Film, emphasized this aspect of filmmaking. Krakauer suggested that film engages reality precisely through its constructed material dimension. This wasn't for Krakauer a pre-given technical cap uh, capacity of all cinema. Rather, it required what he called the process of learning to see to occur in the course of the making and viewing of a film. This process implied a physical uh, aspect, an attunement towards movement, or more generally, a somatic bodily registration during the experience of viewing the film. This awareness came from the way the viewer saw still or stilled things come alive in film. As a result, Krakauer was very careful to differentiate film from photography. This was because Krakauer believed photography had a tendency to fix and determine the visible world, to 
create what Krakauer called a comprehensive catalogue of appearances. In his essay on photography from uh, 1927, uh, he commented on how, quote, the disorder of the detritus reflected in photography cannot be elucidated more clearly than through the suspension of every habitual relationship among the elements of nature, end quote, which seemed to imply that photography had the power to extract and fix meaning. It was, however, one of film's special qualities to reintroduce movement to the photographically frozen world. Um, here's a longish quote. Okay. The capacity to stir up the elements of nature is one of the capacities of film. This possibility is realized whenever film combines parts and segments to create strange con constructs. If the disarray of the illustrated newspapers is simply confusion, the game that film plays with the pieces, pieces of disjointed nature is reminiscent of dreams in which the fragments of daily life become jumbled, end quote. Film therefore contained for Krakauer the potential for the redemption of things, not just their mortification or reification. Based on the activation of things through the medium of film via movement and time, film had a dialectical relationship to reality. The world, film, and viewer interacted. This dialectic created momentum and even drew attention to this process of seeing. As a consequence, Pr uh, Krakauer proposed that film, instead of mimetically reflecting reality, looked under the table of modernity to show us, end quote, pr the, the process of materialization, end quote, how things do or don't enter into meaning in a world dominated by exchange value. In this way, film had the potential to critically mimic, if not ultimately reverse, the process of commodification. For Marx, commodification animated objects with a false vitality. Things had a deceitful power over people when they acquired an exchange value, one aspect of what Marx called the commodities theological capers. Commodification created the illusion of activity in, an anim in an inanimate objects. What film could do was document the, the effects of this process by shaking the commodified object free, if only for a moment, of the dead weight of exchange value. What's interesting here, if we quickly recall Clark's work, is that Krakauer's description of film is a very perceptive account of what we see happening in Clark's films. The apparently fixed world of the Cosmopolitan magazine laid out according to the order of the magazine's picture editor or the demands of the advertiser is reordered in the collaged film. The meaning of the imagery is found to be more indeterminate and is reordered to create new meanings. What appeared fixed is actually changeable. So uh, one set of interpretations that uh, an image is incontrovertibly trying to sell you something is suddenly revealed to contain a quite different meaning. An advert for a pair of gloves is revealed to be a murderous object that can kill. What Krakauer describes as being generally true of films is specifically true of Klaas films. OK, so end of, uh, end of Krakauer. This is the Adorno bit. The suggestion, then, that the animated film could have a documentary value due to the way it foregrounds the construction of movement from stilled things, that the animated film could mediate our relationship to the dead world of exchange value and commodities, was something that Adorno also considered. Ultimately, though, of course, Adorno's analysis was far more pessimistic. Um, he's not a cheerful guy to read, we know. Um, Adorno's comments about film and animation are widely known. He was much more skeptical of the emancipatory potential of cinema than Walter Benjamin, as can be seen when, you know, around the argument about uh, Benjamin's uh, uh, mechanical reproduction essay. And Adorno was particularly wary of the way animation and cartoons were complicit in the culture industry. However, Adorno's later analysis of film does have some interesting relevance when we consider the issue of animation, the document, and in particular, class film. Um, I'm thinking about the essay, Transparencies on Film, from 1966. Um, as Esther Leslie shows in her book, Hollywood Flatlands, the initial history of animation had appeared to indicate that it was a form of filmmaking that allowed the viewer to see the unruly strangeness of the world. Leslie suggests that what uh, that because animated films from the early decades of the 20th century were often chaotic, outrageous, barely controlled sequences of film, where the natural laws controlling the outcome of events could not be predicted, watching a cartoon film could be liberating. However, with the industrialization of animation, companies, uh, sorry, via companies like Disney, the potential for the animated image to show this liberated world, less confined by the regulation of capitalist society, had certainly for Adorno practically evaporated. 
There were, however, traces or fragments of that alternative vision of the world via which film and animation still held open the fragile chance to show the utopian. In uh, this later essay, Transparencies on Film, Adorno suggested that one of the places where we could still escape from industrial control, industrialized control, was when the machine broke down or when, through incompetence, deliberate or not, things went wrong. As Adorno noted, um, start a quote, works which have not completely mastered their technique, conveying as a result something consolingly uncontrolled and accidental, have a liberating quality. End quote. When machines or works of art become erratic and, and unpredictable, the final product or end result is not a foregone conclusion. And depending on what technique and technology the artwork employed, the potential type of creative accident would be different. And filmmaking, obviously enough, created its own vocabulary of breakdown. But what does this mean? Or what did this mean? And how could the viewer critically interpret this? Referring to Krakauer's theory of film on this later essay, uh, Adorno discussed in a more nuanced way than his earlier writing on film how certain types of film and filmmaking could potentially critically examine both their own status as aesthetic objects and the relationship between film, politics, and society. In part, this implied a socio-ontological claim, rather like Krakauer's, in the sense that the technology of filmmaking and cinematic representation inferred a link between filmed appearances and the way the world was constructed. As Adorno put it, quote, by virtue of the relationship to the object, the aesthetics of film is inherently concerned with society, end quote. If this relationship existed, that is to say, if the form and content of the film interacted with the form and content of society, then through the breakdown of the cinematic machine or through the creative incompetence employed in the film's construction, certain social relations could potentially be revealed or analyzed. One way of describing this mediating connection would be to focus on how a film or artwork fitted, molded, adapted, or even defined itself in opposition to historical or social constraints. In his aesthetic theory, Adorno called this adaptation or fit of the artwork aesthetic comportment. Aesthetic comportment describes the way an artwork provokes engagement. It's a strange term. He, he keeps, he keeps seeming seem to alter the definition. Um, it seems to indicate a mediated, sensuous encounter between subject and object. It also seems, that the, the more I've been trying to work out what he's, what he's getting at, it also seems to allude in some way to what Deleuze and Guattari talk about in terms of effect. Um, in a really su suggestive, strange passage, Adorno proposed that uh, here's the quote, aesthetic comportment is to be defined as the capacity to shudder, end quote. So when we shudder, we are registering an encounter with something that manages, perhaps against our better judgment, to touch us. A shudder indicates an entanglement with the unsettling and strange. A shuddering, shaking sh subject is one that is responsive to others' otherness and difference. As Adorno goes on to note, quote, Life in the subject is nothing but what shudders, end quote, because it is the act of being touched by the other. The shuddering self is therefore the subject becoming social. Going back to the earlier point about the breakdown of machinery, when a machine shudders, we become aware of how fragile it is. When the film projector jams, we have to acknowledge the cinematic flow of images is not seamless. When the pixels burn out on the screen, we're shaken out of a seamless world of appearances. If we return one last time to Clark, we can make a, con a concluding link because of two perhaps um, obvious ways which the shudder occurs in Clark's work. Like the protagonist of Altair, the film gets the shakes. Um, within the content of the story, alcohol reduces the female character to a shaking wreck. She, she, she seems erratic and uncomposed by the end of the narrative. The form of the film, however, mirrors the character's addiction and exhibits a different kind of shudder. They're not through alcohol, but through the deliberately clumsy mechanics of the animated cutout um, image. In both cases, a shudder provokes, propels, or questions what we see and think. The idea of the critical shudder certainly seems relevant to a discussion of Clark's film. But does it have a more general application for animation in the animated documentary? 
I think one connection might lie in the way the animated documentary foregrounds the social aspect of filmmaking. It is tempting to suggest that the animated documentary is premised on an encounter with a critical shudder because it is a form that allows us to see in film our shared doubts and uncertainties about our relationship to the world and each other. And this is the very, very fast uh, uh, final conclusion. I'm going to sum up. I want to conclude with a reference to an essay called Documentary Uncertainty from uh, 2007 by the writer and filmmaker Hito Stell. Stell's essay analyzes the paradox of how, uh, here's a quote, the more immediate documentary pictures become, the less there is to see, end quote. Commenting on the way information, facts, news, and reality is now available constantly and inescapably through digital technology, assuming, of course, that you've got access to that technology, um, Stale focuses on the problem of how the immediacy of this reality is actually meaningless. The lack of mediation of this reality actually leads to a lessening of our access to any reality. And so any form that purported to show reality without engaging the issue of how that reality was constructed was in danger of becoming what Stale, Stale called an unmediated documentary. An example of this problem uh, of the unmediated documentary uh, comes uh, in a, a, a thing that she illustrates in her paper, and she relates it to a, an episode of where a CNN reporter, embedded with a group of American soldiers, documented uh, their arrival in Iraq in 2003. The reporter, using their broadcast mobile phone camera, recorded the scene by putting his camera out of the window of the vehicle he was traveling in. Thanks to the technology, the reporter claimed the footage he relayed showed what was happening in the world that was uh, uh, sh showed what was happening in the world in a way that was never before seen. The resulting footage was indeed new, but due to the constraints of the technology, the resulting footage was a series of abstract blotches and patterns, an animated sequence of images and colors that Stale called abstract documentarism. But this particular example of attempting to show the real, here and now, in its immediacy, was too unprocessed. The images meant nothing. Instead, to make the documentary film a figure as a document, to attempt to create an understandable meaning from the manifold strangeness of the world, requires both intervention and mediation on the part of the practitioner. It also requires, I would argue, a sensitivity towards provoking a critical shudder in the viewer and artwork. What makes the question of the animated documentary so interesting is, it seems to me, the way this genre of filmmaking confuse these concerns. Thank you. OK, um, hiya. Uh, thanks for coming to this session. Um, what struck me over the past day or so is that we're, I think we're all kind of merging you know, in using the, the same kind of sources in theory. So I'm going to apologize now if I'm repeating things that have already been said. Hopefully, I'm repeating them in a, in a different way. So the power of artificiality in documentary animation. Documentary theory over the decades has prioritized the study of photographic representation filmed reality and the relation to truth, and thus animation is excluded from this debate. In Claiming the Real in 1995, Brian Winston worries that modern technology undermines the mimetic power of photographic processes and that digital manipulation will have a profound and per perhaps fatal impact on the documentary film. It's incredible, isn't it, 15 years ago that, you know, that, um, Brian is worrying about the, the, you know, the use of um, modern technology and its relation to truth. So 21st century theory adapts and matures alongside digital evolution and documentary filmmakers incorporate performance and manipulation, echoing early notions of Grierson's creative treatment of actuality. The preoccupation with actuality as evidence shifts to acknowledge the sophisticated viewer and that a film's truth is contained in collective information that is not dependent on the filming, sorry, I'm a bit nervous, of real people, um, of real events and people. With reverence to historical and contemporary documentary theory, this brief study aims to explore the cognitive effect of artificiality 
through comparative analysis of three animated documentaries, um, first Beloved Ones by Samantha Moore, In the Same Boat by Emily Bisland, and Do It Yourself by Eric Ledoon. This will be in terms of the aesthetic style, structure of information, use of metaphor, and very brief relation to theory around empathy and reflexivity. So graphic um, aesthetic ideology. Um, interestingly, you know, just looking at these definitions in the dictionary, images conveying meaning, uh, the graphic, the word graphic, and ideology as visionary speculation. We could observe that all images in documentary filmmaking are artificial. The distinction in this study is in the handmade approach to representation, movement, time, sound, and space, as opposed to motorized photographic recording. In an animated documentary, the image goes beyond what it represents and is distinct from the audio. Unlike the unproblematic familiarity of the photograph subject, an alien style disorientates. It is heuristic, causing us to decode the image and ask why it is like that and what it is trying to say. Through colors, marks, technique, texture, ideas are contained, extending and amplifying themes within the, feel, within the film. The style is messenger of meaning. <clears throat> In the following two examples, the animated subjects, or rather the people interviewed, of visual manifestations of their underlying emotional and psychological experience. Beloved Ones, directed by Sam, Sam Moore, is an account of two Ugandan women um, and the impact of AIDS in their community and personal lives. Maureen is 16 years old and now the head of her family as her mother died. Before her death, her mother wrote a memory book. The animated events unfold through pages of this book. The animated form of Maureen places us outside of the actual person. Not seeing Maureen as herself avoids voyeurism and mere sympathy. Because of the animatedness, we are not distracted by the usual habit of reading body language and thus missing spoken information. Facial expression is filtered and movement abbreviated to suggest only the necessary, helping us to concentrate on the voice. At first glance, the bright, simplified forms might seem too gay and naive for such a grim issue. But as the film progresses, the philanthropic quality becomes clear. Set against arid pastel colored backgrounds, the women are adorned in vibrant floral clothes that dominate the screen. Floral patterns appear throughout the film, in the sky, in the plants. You can just see, you know, in that middle image, um, a flowery sort of pattern. In the chickens, and in the utility pots. This central motif is an emblem of feminine strength and hope in adversity and faithfully complements the indexical content of the soundtrack. So moving on to uh, the next example, and I apologize, I'm going to be flitting through these examples. So um, the next film, oh. In the Same Boat by Emily Bisland is the testimony of two men who experience post-traumatic stress. One an Australian Vietnam veteran who is racist and the other an Iranian refugee detained in a camp for years and a victim of racism himself. They are brought together in a psychiatric hospital 
where through unexpected empathy and friendship, the war veteran exercises his racism and undergoes psychological transformation. This theme of transformation is tackled through the changing aesthetic representation of the two men. The past of each man is shown when each confronts painful memories through a periscope. Their blinkered um, self-inspection is harnessed through the suffocating opening. In these oppressed, targeted states, the men are roughly and sparsely drawn with no color other than at one point in this image, Mohammed's face is poignantly brown. Colorless too, um, Alan's eyes become blue in one shot and, um, as if awakening is foreshadowed. Then when they meet in the present, the two men are portrayed as strange stop motion figures, a wooden skeletal frame sandwiched between card as if skin on which their features and clothes are drawn. Both faces are drawn in blue line against white, stripping outward differences to indicate their shared experience, humanity, and ultimate equality. This ragged combination of inner and outer form eloquently delivers the concept of sameness and acceptance. Both are torn, vulnerable, and fragile, yet comforted and recovering through mutual support. The third film um, is not a testimony to individual events, but a rhetorical attack on interrogation torture handbook uh, used for military training, first published in 1963 by the CIA. Do It Yourself by Eric Ledoon exposes edited content from the manual through narrated instructions accompanied by animated sequences suggestive of torture. The victims of torture are represented as fish throughout the film. Deception is carried out through the ambivalence of fish as food and also as pets. So in this first image, we see the fish as real creatures in a pond. <coughs> Next, the fish is specimen, matter of fact detached drawings that might appear in an encyclopedia. We think that this is a good fishing guide, confirmed by the authority, authoritative and questionable ink. Then in complete contrast, as the heads in real family photographs, um, this image is humorous and ridiculous. As the film unfolds, the imagery becomes increasingly congested compositing various styles in the frame, actual fish mixed with emotionless black and white drawings. And then tender flourishes of color in the painted imagery. Um, you could say that it's charming, lighthearted to visceral. It's savage and civilized at the same time. The visual paraphrasing of different styles playfully instills a progressive sense of disgust and pity, whilst also cleverly drawing attention to the desired stages of the victim's psychological and physical demise. Through these different styles, we experience, to use Eric Ledoon's description, a graphic delirium. So, by using artificial, imagined representations of people, inevitably more is visually revealed or inferred. Moving on to the next um, theme, temporal compression. Of course, present in all documentary forms is the author's, filmmaker's <coughs> elision. A mission of unnecessary information is the animator's crucial art. This benefits educational viewing. 
information is more easily remembered in short synoptic form. This inherent compressive tendency of animation occurs through juxtaposition within the frame, diagrammatic treatment, visual bullet pointing of action, and in its ability to mould time. Through these qualities, we are able to gain succinct overview of the situation or themes. In Beloved Ones, Maureen is isolated from her community. Her efforts to improve her life, pursue a career rather than get married, are scorned by those around her. This is effortlessly illustrated through a diagrammatic approach. A flattened perspective shows Maureen and her sister circled by the villagers. The women are trapped in a situation but represent uh, a, con a positive conscious force capable of change. The action in both Beloved Ones and in the same boat is elegantly paced to what is being said. Not controlled by a real capturing of time, the animated action can be both historical and aspirational, condensing key events to illuminate the testimonies rather than observe them. Transition of time and events can appear almost simultaneously, such as the male um, who is ill uh, with AIDS in Beloved Ones. We see his image metamorphosized into a skeleton. The image imagery runs parallel to what is being spoken and epitomizes denial and defeatism, whilst also informing us of his unspoken fate. The content in both Beloved Ones and in the same boat is narratively arranged in concentrated exposition that can linger on an otherwise missed expression, gesture or event. Um, whilst Mohammed speaks of his need for friendship, we see him offering Alan some melon. This gesture is a pivotal point in the relationship between Muhammad and Alan, the great moment of acceptance from where their recovery begins. Time in this scene is extended, the plate of melon, Alan's hesitation, Muhammad's offering, repeated to emphasize the importance of this moment. Eisenstein, speaks of the single frame as a multiple meaning ideogram. Compaction of opposing elements creates a complex viewing, a challenge through deciphering and problem solving. The use of collage juxtaposition in do-it-yourself is carefully calculated to cause dissension. The neutrally illustrated fish uh, appears on top of a gradually emerging electric circuit diagram. This kind of malignant growth occurs frequently within the film sections. This image uh, to the left refers to the interrogation tactic in the handbook of cold shower treatment in an amusing bright aesthetic to the right, a middle-class conservative, right-wing respectable perpetrator eagerly throws the fish to its preparation for a meal, um, the instructions appearing above him for the menu. In a continuing allusion to safe Western domesticity, the next image shows the fish as pet and food. The respectable housewife pr proudly contemplates the fish's dressing, literally a child's romper, ridicules and further complicates by associating the fish with a helpless baby under twisted authoritarian control. An innocent child gracefully expels sordid swarming fish from her undergarment and represents the compliant onlooker, gullible and indifferent. 
Through these examples, we see animation's elasticity in spanning time, information and ideas, and the weaving of a complex, complex tapestry of information. So on to metaphor. Um, in introductory, uh, sorry, in introduction to documentary, Bill Nichols speaks of the use of visual metaphor to flavour understanding and give a moral, social and political coloration. A device used in all three films, the visual metaphor adds texture and sharpens meaning, engaging the viewer in yet further interpretation. In Beloved Ones, the theme of hope is the fabric forming the background on which the animation takes place. The cooking pot alludes to Maureen's aims beyond the traditional female role. It represents the daily struggle for sustenance, confined within her intelligence and vocational preoccupation um, through the images that appear, you know, biological kind of references, scientific references, a computer keyboard. Um, it might also represent sustenance of this fragile dream, which depends on food and enough money to pay to study. The use of the boat to represent the psychological journey um, of the two men is a beautifully conceived metaphor. At first, they are both lost at sea, floating, the periscopes on board enable their introspection and memories. A heavy chain holds them in turmoil. The anchor seen from the bottom of the sea is surrounded by claustrophobic dark water with an unreachable boat on the distant surface. The boat sails in choppy troubled water. As their recovery is reached, the men break the chain together the weight is oh sorry the weight is removed, um, and the water around them becomes brighter. The fish represent the invisible victims of torture. It is cold-blooded, has no feeling, and is a perfectly cynical metaphor for the real victims as dehumanized and worthy of the subsequent interrogation tactics. Through various scenes, torture is suggestive rather than explicit. In one sequence, the use of clever stills, showing a fish with domestic implements and other things wedged on the head, compels us to fill in the gory gaps using our own imagination, which is a powerfully immersive device. The kitchen is a torture chamber. The hunting and preparation for cooking are visual and conceptual substitutes for the real acts of torture. The sardine tins floating like coffins in the sea towards the end of the film suggests neatly packaged execution has finally occurred. The real Argentinian victims of the 1970s were thrown from helicopters into the sea. The backgrounds in all three films are psychological and emotional spaces. Their concern is with interior representation rather than a visual description of a real time or place. So cognitive aspects, and this is a very limited um, you know, reflection on these. A lot more work and study needs to go into this. So this brief, brief section is concerned with cognitive design and intention rather than reception, and is limited to the examination of two themes only. The pursuit of all documentary film is to present knowledge and raise awareness that, as well as fulfilling our desire to know, also initiates empathy, better still compassion, 
or provokes a reflexive reaction such as anger. So in terms of empathy, the photographically filmed documentary is an excellent medium that is scientific testament to events. It is evidence of outward behavior and indisputably documents our real material physical existence. However, we cannot see how someone feels by looking at them in photographic form. We might experience sympathy from doing so. We might feel for their situation. Our own feelings are not necessarily true to the feelings of the documented people. Looking at surfaces does not reveal the inner depths. In contrast, animation cannot show this real surface, but serves as an imaginative springboard through which we share emotional knowledge and harness the invisibly real. These imaginary worlds beckon us to use our own imaginative powers in co-feeling, imagining ourselves in their situation and thus evoking a deeper understanding through empathy rather than sympathy. Goldman, in Empathy, Mind and Morals, refers to this as an art of emotional telepathy. Milan Kundera, in The Unbearable Lightness of Being, states, there is nothing heavier than compassion. Not even one's own pain feels so heavy as the pain one feels with someone. A pain intensified by the imagination and prolonged by a hundred echoes. In Beloved Ones, the salient point of empathetic awakening for me is the metaphysical scene where Maureen evaporates into the photograph of her bedridden mother. In this, we feel grief with her. The impossibility of this action beautifully encom encompasses the real act of remembering a loved one. We feel compassion through our own fears and experiences of life's departure. Entering into a memory is all we can do to sustain the fact of a life. As we might do on our own memories of loved ones, Maureen brings alive her mother's legacy and steps out of the image, comforted and strengthened to cope with the situation and not lose hope. This ancestral concept of hope is fundamental to all human existence and we must hope with her and draw from her strength. Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry, going on. Okay. I should be reading quicker, I think. <laughs> In the same boat, eloquently describes the mental transition from traumatic states of stress to recovery. Whilst both films are clearly about specific events and situations particular to these people, the metaphysical properties of animation, um, in Paul's words, extends the single experience to the universal. That is, each film taps into the viewer's emotional reservoir, calling on collective human experience. Empathy is a source of emotional and moral education. Um, reflexivity. In opposition to empathy, do-it-yourself aims to create disgust. We are not allowed to identify with the fish. It is the object to which things happen, and we are the spectators and colluders. In terms of provoking an indignant response, do-it-yourself uses a high level of reflexivity. It is designed to cause confusion through deception. At first, the film appears to be about fishing, but as the style changes and the fish are subjected to grotesque torture, we question the spoken content, experience progressive repulsion, and by the end realize the sickly content to be about real uh, practices violating human rights. Conflict is further extended by a jolly music track reminiscent of 60s advertising and by the optimistic authoritarian uh, tone of the speaker who reads out sections from the real manual. We are taken on the roller coaster of reactions, detachment, humor, pity, and revulsion, colluding to incite disagreement with the content and invoke protest of the clandestine military operations. 
The formal and political perspectives in the film rely on these jarring techniques. Nichols states, achieving a higher state of consciousness involves a shift in levels of awareness. Reflexive documentary sets out to readjust the assumptions and expectations of its audience. Um, reflexive viewing has a long history. Vertov's desire to break the mesmeric spell of cinema reveals the camera as the eye. Eisenstein's montage theories, theatrical theories of Piscator and later Brecht all advocate the production reception contract as bi-directional discussion. Um, I've ne I'm nearly done, okay. Particularly pertinent to this is the raising of awareness and an inherent quality of animation is the notion of making strange Ostranany proposed by Russian formalist Shlovsky, 1921. He speaks of a poetic art that uses literary devices to defamiliarize that with which we are overly familiar. He claimed we cease to see the world we live in and become anesthetized to its distinctive features. Through creatively deforming the usual, formalist theory aims to disrupt stock responses, generating heightened states of awareness that counteracts numb recognition. Because of its heterogeneous handmade nature, animation cannot be aesthetically straight-jacketed and is free from desensitized modes of perception. Known as master of deconstruction, political and social dramatist Bertolt Brecht surfaces frequently documentary discussion uh, for his own brand of distancing. V from Dung technique translated roughly as the alienation effect. Uh, he used theatrical devices to jolt his audience from passive cathartic response to an awareness of the player's illusion. He discouraged sentimental attachment to the characters opposing Stanislavski and emotional acting using untrained actors that were placed within the audience. He also uses projected footage um, as backdrops. Okay, then I'll just finish with the last paragraph. Um, Bertolt Brecht's work is not the work of a dramatist, but of a literary historian. Animation's overt artificiality results in reflexive viewing, a heightened state of critical awareness. The viewing experience is intellectually immersive and non-cathartic as the viewer engages in stringing the disparate elements of sound style and content to form the message truth of the film and interpret its factual orientation. It avoids the subject as victim, aids efficient and memorable understanding of the fact and honestly presents and provokes multidimensional subjectivities. Um, I hope Vertov won't turn in his grave, but I'm going to use his words and state that animation documentary renders a higher mathematics of fact. Um, okay, so this is a case study on uh, Jonas Odell, and uh, uh, trying to keep the time limits, I'm going to uh, cut out the vision of the films that I will take for granted that you know already. Um, so, uh, in the three animated documentary and reenactment in the works of Jonas Odell, in the three most recent works by Jonas Odell, whose professional experience is rooted into animation, we can assume some of the conditions for which his films are de facto generally considered animated documentaries. Each of the short films we here present start off from a collection of true interviews with pe persons questioned on specific issues. Such audio interviews integrated in the films as voiceover are the foundations on which the narrations are based upon. By the style, techniques, and languages used, the animator filmmaker packages uh, the story in such a way as to make it undeniably more interesting and attractive to a wider audience. A complete live action shooting of the interview, audio and video, without such an authorial packaging, I'm using the word that Jonas himself uses, would achieve neither the same effect nor impact. 
Each episode outstands for its own style, within which may converge a variety of styles, languages, and techniques. The choice of style and technique is closely related to the stories told. From this point of view, choices are not dictated only by aesthetic needs, but spring also and mostly from the sense and the meaning of the story itself, thus strengthening it. For example, in Never Like the First Time, each of the four episodes correspond to particular styles tailored on the protagonists interviewed in relation to age, gender, experience, tone. This distinction is constant in all the short films examined and is the result of Odell's uh, specific intention to righteously render stories already solid and interesting as they are. Such technical and stylistic choices, however, allow other communicational codes, be they metaphorical, emotional, subjective, artistic, that can translate into images the tone or the inflection of the interviewee's voice, his or her subjectivity, but even more that of the author interpreting the fact. <coughs> the first of Jonas O'Dell's films that we examine is made up of four different stories. Each one is based on an authentic interview, each turned into images by using different techniques and styles. None are pure live action. Common theme is the first time each of the protagonists has made love. So, four characters are presented, different in age, gender, experience, with four different narrations of their own erotic initiations. And even the tone varies from humoristic to tragic, from intimate to explicit. Curiously, under the unifying umbrella of the 15-minute short film, a wide range of differences from all points of view are collected. Also for this, Odell has chosen four distinctive modes of visualization. The film thus opens with the introduction caption that contextualizes and authentifies the testimonies. Quote, the following interviews were recorded between August and October 2002. End quote. Also, the second film, Lies, is composite, made up this time of three perfectly true stories about lies. Here also, each episode is based on an authentic interview, each one turned into images with diverse techniques and styles. We can notice a more marked use of a live action video electronically treated to make it all more graphic and animated. Particularly in the first episode, the reenactment of the narrated event was shot in live action with real actors. It's the story of a burglar who, once detected, declares being an accountant at the firm doing overtime. For the second story of a child who first lies and then confesses a crime never committed, the style and technique used belong in a more traditional way to the domain of naive cartoons for children. The 13-minute short film at last ends with the testimony of a woman whose whole life has been marked by a chain of lies. Uh, the woman's final lines, with which the whole movie draws to its conclusion, sound like a hint of reflection upon one of the reasons for making an animated documentary, that is, the contribution of a subjective reality that completes the objective one based upon authentic material, that is, upon the people's testimonies. Still trying to understand, quote, as if I cannot find the truth in my own story, unquote, the pure authentic factum to describe reality in a complete way is not enough. Much less when you delve introspectively into people, there is another part of reality that passes through the subjectivity of the protagonist witness, but also through who collects and expresses it. Let's leave Jonas Odell himself to comment this work. Quote, I felt that each story needed its own style, both in terms of graphics, but also in terms of the cinematic storytelling, editing, and so on, because they are very different stories. 
In the case of the middle story about the kid who steals money from his mother, I felt a more naive looking style would be more appropriate. Whereas for the other two, I felt we needed to work with characters based on live actors that we shot because they were much more serious in tone. There are also differences in how the different segments are edited and told cinematically, like the first story about the burglar where we tried to match his energy and restlessness in the way we worked with the camera as well. The author alleges that in his own way of working, for this film in this case, he displays an assortment of graphic and cinematographic styles, of ways of narrating and of editing in relation with the specificity of each story and of how he perceives and interprets it. Such differentiations can be unfolded from one film to another, from one episode to another within the same short film as in Lies, from one moment to another within the same episode, quite obvious in the final third episode mentioned above. The different approaches or treatments are not unarranged or unbalanced toward a sole need, such as aesthetic or didactic, but are the result of conscious choices that integrate and synthesize the various expressive necessities, fully exploiting the expressive flexibility and the added value that animation can allow. In short, there is a direct close relation between the authentic documentary material and the use of animated film techniques and languages. It is also true that there is a selection upstream of the interviews aimed at the best making of the film. That is, among the criteria of choice of the authentic material to be used, Besides the subject matter itself and the quality of the testimonies given by the people interviewed about the issue of lying, there is also the, criter the criteria aimed at the final output. The pre-production stage of selection of the interviews to turn into images is necessary to understand also which oral stories among those that are interesting are best suitable to be translated into images. Quote, still from uh, Odell, we did quite a lot of interviews for the film. I think we made about 30 interviews with different people and during the process I listened to the interviews, I started editing some of them to see how they worked as a narrative and I had them go back and ask some more questions to try to work the stories into film narrative. Out of those 30, we chose in the end three stories. Really, I think all 30 stories deserved telling, but I think in the end, the choice had to be which ones I thought I could do justice on film." End of quote. The filmmaker, along with his collaborators, takes on the task of personally intervening on the treatment of the original sources and, when necessary, of expanding and integrating them. One of the filmmaker's main objects is no doubt to make a believable and acceptable movie that can tell true stories. His concern is therefore to mediate between the original oral source, the interviews, and the final result, the viewing of the audience, in the way that he deems, according to the case, more useful, likely, expressive, satisfactory, productive, honest. In doing this, he brings on together, inevitably and willingly, his own subjective point of view and interpretation, treatment and expression of the reality at issue. Quote, thinking about all the three films we've made based on interviews, it's really become a project where you find stories that you think are strong in themselves and worth retelling and packaging them to make them accessible to a larger audience. I guess my contribution in, is packaging these stories that are strong already from the beginning." End of quote. The fact that Odell refers to his own actions as packaging does not belittle the type of work he does. He is simply highlighting one of the functions of the animated documentary, that is, to make a true story more accessible and immediate. 
Instead, the modesty of limiting his own role to that of a packager of stories and images barely hides the active interpretative role that the author has, clearly manifest as we have seen by the use itself of animation. How much his subjective point of view, expressed and exposed by the animation, actually blends with the authenticity and truth of the original sources is a common issue with other animated documentary filmmakers. Odell does not deny posing himself the question, as well as questioning himself on what a true story really is and on if the witnesses are actually telling the truth or not. Quote, when you work with these allegedly true stories, you get kind of paranoid about whether people are actually telling the truth or whether they are lying. That led me to thinking that lies and deception might be a great theme for a film." End of quote. Since the stories about first sexual intercourse is in Never Like the First Time, Odell has asked himself how much truth was there and how much was invented in the interviews given by the prompted people. This order of reflection has brought him to deal with the issue of lying in the film mentioned so far, as the final lies, lines in Lies, Legner, uh, implicitly suggest the issue remains open. Finally, let's consider the last film of an ideal trilogy of Jonas Odell's animated documentaries, that is to say, To Silago. Uh, I was supposed to put it on now for you to see, but I'll just go on with the paper, and if we have just two minutes, we'll see an excerpt. To Silago, up to this moment, appears to be his most accomplished and unitary work. Point of arrival, yet different from the previous, the 14 minute 30 second film narrates a single story, that of West German terrorist Norbert Kröcher's former girlfriend. The man was arrested in Stockholm on the 31st of March 1977, and in the days that followed, so were a few suspects, among which his former mate, here called anonymously A. In particular, Kircher was at the head of a group that the year before had planned the kidnapping of Swedish Minister of Immigration Anne Greta Leon, member of the Rote Arme Fraktion, RAF, known also as the Bader Meinhof Group. As some others in the terrorist band, Kircher had decided to hide out for a while in Sweden. Yet, the film is not centered on the man, or at least not in a direct way, but on the woman, whose more subjective, personal, and even romantic side emerges from her own words, collected via interview. The woman retraces, in voiceover, her reckless years of juvenile irresponsibility, spent between mad, lo mad love and bank robberies. What paradoxically rises up is an ingenuous and almost innocent side. Also, in this case, Odell chooses to reenact the event narrated, resorting to live action shooting of professional actors and then treating the footage with a, var a variety of digital effects and integrating with animation, graphics, and whatever expressively useful. In this way, he can, above all, contextualize A's testimony in time, fashion, way of life, thought, iconography, and Swedish society of the 70s. Again, with conscious precision, the filmmaker makes aesthetic documentary informational and cinematographic instances harmoniously converge into a compact, though complete worked, work that combines both the objectivity of events and the subjectivity of feeling. Among the noteworthy aspects, outstands of 70s pop aesthetics, highlighting dotted screen printing in the manner of Roy Lichtenstein, floral layouts in backgrounds and textures, movie posters and vinyl record covers. Photographs and newspapers come to life in the mobility within the shots in order to increase in meaning what is being narrated, while they also define the aesthetics and rhythm of the film. As we have seen in the previous films, the filmmaker avoids useless iconic redundancy and often leaves the background clear, except to contain only the really interesting visual elements. 
Other times, the background characterizes the scene with pregnant signifying aesthetics, such as with period newspapers, collages of clippings, wallpapers, or by disseminating the background with clocks, comic strips, or floral decorations. Final considerations. In the first episode of the first film, the animation facilitates the insertion that marks an extremely subjective, slow interior time. Furthermore, the animation visually reconstructs and materializes memory, as in the third episode of Never Like the First Time, about the girl who has a loss of consciousness during the violent party she takes part in. The, the graphic styles, the kinds of editing, the layout respond also to an aesthetic need and are well integrated in the requirements of historical, social, cultural contextualization of each story. In Tusilago, for instance, all the elements relate to the other forms of the 1970s pop culture. The quick anxiety-inducing editing of the first episode of Lies, or of the one about the raped girl in Never Like the First Time, meets a music video aesthetics, but is also quite functional to the facts narrated. Last, th last slide. The high extent of flexibility and synthesis of animation allows the author to condense descriptions and events in little time and space in such a way that not always is possible with live action. Thus, it can enrich the short format. It gives the short film format a further possibility of multi-layered quality and of a narration more condensed in time, as is the case with the introduction of memorandum book pages in the second episode of Never Like the First Time and with the clocks gone haywire in Tusilago. In this sense, animation represents a further possibility available to the filmmaker. Due to its suggestive power, unhingeable from narrow concreteness of reality, animation allows, according to necessity, more imaginative, concise, evocative, symbolic, and metaphorical visual solutions. For this, it can pervade the spectator with a variety of codes and reading levels, touching the viewer even with stories that are more difficult to tell. The iconography used in the last episode of Never Like the First Time has an old-fashioned taste, and the digital cutout technique used strengthens it in an unparalleled way. Still, in the same episode, so does the moment that we do not see in which the couple undress, visually suggested by illustrations of clothes and scraps from a vintage catalog. Combining aesthetic needs and uh, with those of expression and meaning, we can see how Odell prefers digital manipulation even when he resorts to live action. The reenactments of episodes made with real live actors, the first and third episodes of Lies and the whole of Tusilago, are shot with a video camera and then digitally treated, manipulated, animated. Paradoxically, but not that much if we take into the consideration of what we have stated so far, the digital effects honestly exposed as to colors, shapes, settings, make the reenactment more believable than if they had been left in their original visual form. By withdrawing from live action visuals, the reenactments uh, lose that halo of fake to acquire the authenticity of the declared narration and interpretation. Not to forget, the voiceover of the interviewees guarantees for the authenticity of the story, though not necessarily for the truth of what is told. Final page. The explicit notion that we are dealing with manipulated images is a further act of honesty and so of authenticity. The concept itself of animated documentary problem problematizes the notion of documentary and the ideas of truth and reality in filmmaking. While the audience is aware of the fact that behind the techniques used and the overtly manipulated images, there is a point of view and therefore not an objectiveness, with live action shooting, such ambiguity may be less exposed and thus taken as more objective. Though underlying, 
The concern of hiding the interviewee's identities instead doesn't seem to be dominant in these films. A potential of the contribution of animation is also the ability to reach a wider or different audience. The audience of animated films and that of music video, another of Odell's successful professional environments, is mostly rooted among the younger generations, for instance. Final, summarizing the specific motivations that justify and take to the choice of documenting reality through animation, in Odell's work, we can single out the following points. Animation substitutes authentic visual material, which is absent, found footage or photographs, which are at times instead inserted in a recreated context, and live action reenactments with real actors by digital treatment. Of the authentic interviews made beforehand remains the voiceover with a narrative function in each episode, integrated and completed by the animation that shows the events, reinterpreting them, though bonded to the oral testimonies. The need to hide or camouflage part of the live action shooting, namely of the people interviewed, is underlying but in these cases is not preeminent. The will to openly expose the subjectivity and the particular points of view, both of the narrator and of the filmmaker, is clear. The will to convey a particular emotional impact, not necessarily strictly connected to the mere facts documented, is also manifest. There is the will to give the work also a certain artistic, stylistic, expressive imprint. And finally, animation is chosen to reach a wider audience in a more attractive way. Sorry if I've been reading too fast. Thank you. Thank you.